Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ryan and welcome to Central Park. We know it can still be pretty difficult getting to Central Park, so we want to continue to bring the park to you through a handful of virtual programs like our longer 45 minute virtual tours, as well as our shorter informal 15 minute weekly walks. Um, thank you for joining us today again for a weekly walk for fishing at the Harlem Mirror with me, Ryan, on today, June 8th, 2022. As always, these weekly walks are gonna take you through different landscapes of the park, exploring different topics and ideas, things that we absolutely love here in the park, like recreational activities, such as fishing, which we're gonna be talking a little bit about today. All the photos you're gonna see were taken by myself here in Central Park over the past few days. Uh, with the exception of just a few historical photos I accessed use, using various databases, such as the Museum of the City of New York, as well as our Central Park Conservancy databases. Um, as we do make our way through the park today, I do have one new announcement. Nothing is really changing, but there is going to be one slight adjustment to our weekly walks. Uh, rather than telling you we're going to be about 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to be a little more honest with ourselves and just say that we're going to be about 30 minutes. So the weekly walks are now going to be coming really 30 minutes as they've kind of always been. Of course, it's been a little difficult to keep them in 15, 20 minute realm. So we're going to be taking about 25 to 30 minutes for this weekly walk. Again, nothing has changed as I always usually go a little bit over our time frame anyway. But just want to let everybody know that we will be commencing around about 1 p.m. today as we begin our little weekly walk, which is fishing at the Harlem Mirror. So as we jump into our walk, I do want to thank you for being supporters of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, the nonprofit that cares for Central Park, preserving and celebrating it as a sanctuary from the pace and pressures of city life, enhancing the enjoyment and well-being of all. And as we explore around the park today, we're of course using Zoom, so please use the chat feature if you want to share maybe a favorite fish you might have caught here in Central Park or any New York City park or river for that matter. Um, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature. My colleague Jose will be on the back end answering any questions that you might have. Last thing you'll see pop up are some visitor polls I'll launch throughout the walk. And once everybody has voted in those, I can share the results. You'll of course also see some transcripts popping up. You can disable those on your Zoom toolbar, clicking on that little CC or live transcript option. Now, as we do begin our walk, I'd like to launch a first poll, a simple one. Have you ever gone fishing in Central Park or New York City in general? It doesn't have to be Central Park, but any New York City park. And if you have, there's going to be a second part to that question. So let everybody vote in that as we look over the map. Now, we're, of course, exploring fishing at the Harlem Mirror. While there are about seven or eight water bodies here in Central Park, there's one that I think above all really stands out as the winner for a fishing spot. And that's the Harlem Mirror. And we'll learn a little bit why I feel that way as we make our way through the park. But we're gonna be getting, uh, begin our tour at 110th Street, right on Malcolm X Boulevard, otherwise known as Sixth Avenue. As we start to enter the park from this area, we're immediately getting some nice little views of the upper Harlem area. And as we turn our, uh, our attention or view towards the park, we can immediately start to get some glimpses of the Harlem Mirror, the water body we're going to be exploring around today. Now, as we make our way a little bit closer, we can come up to the shoreline of the Harlem Mirror, which immediately greets us as we enter this northeastern section of the park. One of the reasons this water body is so great. And of course, coming in, we get to see the expansiveness of this about third largest water body here in Central Park. Mirror is simply Dutch for lake. And of course, there's a lot of beautiful lake views to get, as well as beautiful colors coming from the shoreline plants, like these iris flowers. We actually saw some iris flowers in Shakespeare Garden not too long ago when we took a weekly walk. And we learned that these are named after the Greek goddess Iris, which actually means the goddess of the rainbow, because these flowers tend to come in a lot of different colors and blooms. But these nice little purple, white, and yellow blooms add a little bit of beauty to our walk along the shoreline of the Harlem Mirror. And as we start to ride along the shoreline, we can admire plenty of the beautiful greens, all the reeds and plants, which sometimes open up, giving us a little window towards wildlife. And here we see almost a perfectly statuesque turtle sitting perfectly in this little opening, giving us a nice little view of our first wildlife encounter. And we are sure to see plenty of turtles as we walk around the mirror today. We might actually see more turtles than we see fish. 
So we'll keep our eye open as we continue walking along and find some other hidden little signs along here, such as these really important reminders that we shouldn't be feeding wildlife. I know it can be very tempting, but oftentimes the food that we provide wildlife, like breads and things like that, are actually really bad for a lot of wildlife and actually don't properly um, give them the nutrition they need. We might not see the uh, ducks that are eating this bread being directly affected, but their offspring can develop things such as angel wing, which is basically um, a deformed growth that they'll experience, which prevents them from flying and ultimately leads to their death. So we do want to, again, remember, if we truly love wildlife, help keep wildlife wild by not feeding them, because they have plenty of foods available. And as we come to some of these little shoreline areas, we can find not only perfect fishing spots, but also perfect areas to experience wildlife up close and personal. As we make our way past this first fishing spot, I'll actually end that first poll and share the results. And we can see that a majority of people haven't had the opportunity to go fishing uh, in New York City or just New York in general. So we're actually gonna tell you a couple ways in which you can maybe change that. So maybe next time you'll have the opportunity to have gone. And I actually am interested to see there's an even split between freshwater and saltwater fishing. Of course, here in Central Park, you're only gonna have the option to do freshwater fishing. We'll talk a little bit about, again, ways in which maybe those who haven't gone fishing before can change that here in New York City. Uh, as we continue walking along this nice little fishing spot, we can, of course, glance over into the water. And what are we going to see? None other than fish. Might be a little hard as they tend to blend in with this sort of kind of murky in our per current view look of the water. But if I highlight one of those fish, you can see one of these sunfish, which are hanging around in a group over here. Actually, while we're seeing this group of fish, I do want to launch a second poll. The second poll is one that's kind of a little bit more of a trivia question, but one that I thought would be fun to talk about. Uh, so, fish friends, when fish stay together for social reasons, are they schooling or shoaling? Shoaling might be a new word for some of you, but I'll let everybody vote in that as we admire this little group of sunfish that we can see floating in the water just over here. Now you'll find many varieties of different fish to be found in all the water bodies here in Central Park, but in areas like the Harlem Mere, you can find a lot of different sunfish from green to bluegill to pumpkin seed sunfish. But of course, you can also find some much larger varieties of fish in these areas, such as some largemouth bass. You can find some chain pickerel, some brown cowhead catfish, as well as large ornamental koi, like the koi fish we can see pictured here. Not a goldfish, but rather a big koi carp. A really interesting fish that can be found up in this northern section of the park. And up in the Harlem Mere in particular, it's actually probably your best area to find a large fish. We can actually see this little chart, which comes from the um, Department of Environment, Environmental Cons Conservation, who completed a survey back in 2018 specifically looking at largemouth bass, a favorite of many anglers, and basically seeing how many were caught per hour of trying to catch them, comparatively to a couple other parks we can see here, but specifically I have highlighted both Central Park Lake and Harlem Mere. We can see that even though the lake is larger in size, the Harlem Mere is gonna produce a lot more larger fish like largemouth bass with over 29 over uh, 15 inch fish. And you can see comparatively to many of the other parks, even the very, very large Prospect Park Lake, we have a lot of sizable bass here, which is why the Harlem Mere has continued to be one of the best areas to go fishing in Central Park. You can find more information like this on uh, the New York City Parks Department, as well as the De uh, Department of Environmental Conservation's website. As we continue along, though, we have to remember that we're not just seeing fish in the water. There's also other wildlife that are sharing the park, like plenty of birds, as well as, of course, like we've seen before, plenty of turtles. So we do want to be careful, of course, moving our hooks and our rods away from any oncoming fish or uh, rather any oncoming turtle, amphibians, reptiles, or waterfowl. So do be careful and mind the other wildlife while you're trying to catch a specific one. As we continue down a little bit, I would like to share that second poll result I launched for you. And as we make our way to the Dana, I'll end and share that. All right, so are you ready? The answer is actually, kind of a trick question here, the answer is actually shoaling, 
So schooling is going to be when groups of fish are swimming in the same general direction or moving together. But when fish are kind of hanging out for social reasons, that's going to be shoaling. Now, these two terms are used kind of loosely, and you will find sort of actually defined out terms for them, but often we see these terms again loosely being used. Schooling is more often used, but shoaling specifically when fish are remaining together, more for social reasons. And when you go to a lot of the edges of Harlem Mears, you'll see a lot of fish just kind of floating next to each other in these large shoals for groups. So an interesting little term that you can think about and keep an eye out for shoals of fish next time you stop by the park. As we continue along, I'll uh, just make sure I share those results for everybody. We'll come up to the Dana Center. And as we come up to the Dana Center, we come up to what is probably Fish Central here at the Harlem Mirror. Charles A. Dana Center, like many of our other visitor centers, not only uh, gives out maps, directions, and insight, but also a lot of amazing materials to play around and explore this area. Beyond things like discovery kits and lawn games, you can get catch and release fishing poles to utilize here. Now, fishing in Central Park is a little bit easier than some other areas. We do rent out a series of fishing poles to those that are 16 years and under. You do have to be under 16 years old to rent out one of these fishing poles without using a license. But if you are over 16, you can very easily acquire a license. Um, if you do go onto the web and web search uh, New York City Fishing License or New York State Fishing License, the first link will pop up and it's the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, if you do check the chat, I'll have my colleague Jose share this link as well. But going on this page, you can find the simple way to apply online or visit an in-person location and acquire a fishing license, which costs about $25 for the year. Or you can even get ones for the day, for the week, and so on. So really easy to come out and experience fishing. You can find some different options as well um, for freshwater and salt water and whatever really fits your fancy. But if you are under the age of 16 and you would like to come try fishing here, you can stop by the Charles A. Dana Center when they're open any day between Wednesday and Sunday where fishing poles are available between 10 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. These are free. You do need to show just a valid New York State or any type of identification card, but the polls are free with yours to, uh, for you to borrow, along with corn to use as bait. And our fishing poles are drop line, which means there's no casting. So that's why you do not need a fishing license to operate them. And of course, there are plenty of great areas to fish just outside the Charles A. Dana Center. If you are over the age of 16, though, and you don't want to get a fishing license, keep your eye open um, on both the DEC's website as well as the New York City Parks Department website for annual free fishing days, which do not require you to utilize a license. So there are plenty of options, whether you'd like to purchase a pretty inexpensive fishing license, borrow a pole for free, or visit one of the typically annual free fishing days held throughout the five boroughs in New York City. But coming out here, whether you have a pole or not, is certainly a beautiful area to visit and experience. And as we walk along the water, you'll be able to find fisher uh, or um, anglers of all different skill levels, whether it be more expert anglers that are working on their fly fishing techniques, or maybe some newer anglers just getting into this sport and this recreational activity. No matter what, stopping along the Harlem Mere will really give you a whole different new look at this activity and really give you an opportunity to see some um, different types of poles and materials that you might not have even known existed. I've certainly seen some really interesting gear out here that anglers have brought to try to catch specific fish from different lures, different types of reels. But of course, these um, pieces of equipment are fun no matter what you have, whether it be an expert setup or a beginner setup. And even the drop line poles offer a great way for kids to learn a little bit about these aquatic species up close and personal. You can also sign up classes to rent out these fishing poles at the Charles A. Dana Center. And if you do visit the catch and release page on our centralparknyc.org website, I'll have my uh, colleague Jose share that link as well. You can find out more information about reserving these polls for a group or a larger class, as well as um, other information about just general catch and release protocol. As we walk along and try to find a good spot to go fishing, always keep your eye out because you'll probably see more than just fish. Do you see the wildlife pictured in this photo? Might be surprised if you do because it's very well camouflaged. 
looking in a little bit closer, we can see quite a large bullfrog hanging out here. This one actually almost the size of a small football, uh, but a nice little frog that we get to see, a nice little amphibian as we walk around the Har Harlemere area. We can also hear these animals more than we typically see them. If you ever hear a loud, almost kind of cow honking type of sound as you're walking around a water body, it's coming from a bullfrog. We were making some interesting mating calls around this time. But keep your eyes open and you might see one of these so, uh, more seldom seen wildlife. As we walk around, we'll continue to see plenty of opportunity for fishing, which is one of the reasons the Mir is a great spot to come fishing because there's really not too much competition. There's a lot of different area in which you can spread out and get either a nice cast if you do have a fishing license or a drop line spot. So certainly uh, spread around as you come to this area and don't feel like you have to stand just in front of the Dana Center. As we continue walking along the path, we can also notice some material set up to make it a little bit easier for fishing, such as these little sections along some of the lampposts, which not only have reminders of the rules of fishing, but also have these little almost uh, submarine periscope looking pieces on them. Often you'll see a sign attached to these. This one actually is missing it which adds a little bit of mystery to it. But what these are, these are basically simply spots to discard your um, discarded or abandoned fishing line. Of course, fishing line is something we want to avoid leaving in the park. And looking around some of the popular fishing areas, you often do see fishing lines stuck in trees. Might be hard to see this one, but if I highlight it, you can see the very uh, tensed out string of fishing lines stuck in here. Of course, these pose a big risk to wildlife like different bird species, as well as pl plenty of different aquatic species using the mirror. So we do want to try to avoid these at all costs, especially since it's very difficult to remove these once they're all tangled up in trees. So if you do come fishing here and you do have to cut a line or you do tangle up some wire, make sure that we do get that into the proper disposed areas. Uh, we do want to try to avoid just growing that traditionally in the grass or in the trash because of course that tangled wire can end up in the landfill eventually in the water and eventually choking out wildlife. So we actually do use these special um, fishing line recycling areas to properly dispose of fishing line and chop it up before it is discarded. And of course you can remember that even if your trash ends up in a trash can, a majority of trash actually eventually ends up in some type of water body. And trash or anything in water takes about three times as long to compose, decompose as it would if it were on land. So as we make our way around the park, we of course want to keep it clean. And we can also notice some different little plaques existing along our walk. This one giving a little bit of credit to a philanthropist named Merrill Lynch, who helped to fund some restoration within this area back in 1993. As we continue just a little down the, uh, down the path, we'll notice another one of these signs, this plaque honoring another philanthropist, Sissy Patterson, who would also help to fund restoration in this area around 1993. You'll notice a few of these subtle reminders of the overwhelming amount of contribution and help that's gone into caring for Central Park. And as we look to photos of the past, we can remember how far the Harlem Mirror has truly come. For just about 40 or 50 years ago, this was not an area you would come for fishing or relaxing as the landscape looked very different and probably didn't really have many, if any, fish surviving in that mess of a garbage pile. This is what the heart of the mirror looked back throughout the 70s and 80s. It wasn't until about 1990, between about 1990 and 1994, that this northern section in the Harlem Mirror underwent some major restoration work in which not only the Harlem Mirror, but the shoreline of the mirror was restored and revitalized. Today, luckily, we have a very happy and healthy Harlem Mirror, with primarily a majority of it being a natural shoreline. While we do have quite a few areas that serve as either boat landings or fishing spots, the majority of the mirror you'll find is covered with nice grasses, reeds, shrubs, and other aquatic plants that provide wildlife a great home, as well as a much more beautiful view for us. Also serving as a bit of a natural fence, taking away that a little bit uglier black fencing we had around here previous. Luckily, ever since 1994 on, we've seen this area being just immaculate. And around that same time is when we see the Dana Center opening in 1993 and the fishing program beginning just the year after in 1994, with some of the first poles going out in June of that month or June of that year.
Um, originally, the first poles were about 50 bamboo rods that would provide, again, same as they do today, free access for people to come and fish here in the Harlem Mere. As we walk along the Mere today, we'll make our way along the eastern section and explore a little bit of the south edge of the Mere for the rest of our walk. As we make our way down, remember, you might see these signs in various water bodies throughout the summer months, reminding us of algae blooms that can occur. Algae is really changing the tint of the water rather than the stuff floating on top of it. So while we might find areas like this that might seem like very algae infested areas, there actually might not be. This, for example, is not algae, but rather a top floating plant known as duckweed. Duckweed is something that anybody that's explored the North End, like the Pool or the Harlem Mere, probably is familiar with seeing from time to time throughout the summer months. It's a very small lily pad-like plant that blooms in high numbers and sometimes causes a lot of uh, clogged waterways. We do remove this when it gets overwhelming, but of course, in smaller amounts, it's a wonderful food source for a lot of wildlife. And it's a fun little interesting plant to add another shade of green to the park's many, uh, uh, already many beautiful colors. But as we make our way through the park, of course, it is hard to identify many of these small plants, though it's always rather uh, they're better to be safe than sorry. Do avoid, of course, water bodies as you naturally would. There's, of course, no swimming in the water bodies, so do avoid that, continuing, uh, continue to avoid that, as well as avoid having any of our four-legged friends go in water bodies, because these algae blooms can, of course, affect them as well. So we do want to be safe and, of course, respect the wildlife, keeping it as wild as possible. As we make our way down, we can enjoy again the many shades of greens and the patterns that we see within them as well. Walking down along some of these reeds, many of them being a uh, Phragmite or a relatively invasive growing reed known as mile a minute reed. They do of course block the view in some areas, but also add again some interesting color and design. I love these little ripples and these kind of crinkly effects that we're getting on these reeds as we walk by. And just taking a moment to appreciate the different designs we can see, even in a patch of what just seems like uniform green, can always open our eyes to some new beauty we might not have experienced. But as we continue walking past this wall of green, we'll make our way to the south edge of the Harlem Mere. And as we start to wrap up, yet another wonderful little fishing spot. This one providing a little bit more privacy than some of the others, as well as giving us a shadier view underneath a very large oak tree. But as we walk around the water body, we can enjoy the, again, many different fishing spots and many different blooms that are being provided to us, like these beautiful oak leaf hydrangeas. Oak leaf hydrangea, a very common plant to find all throughout the park, and one that again offers a beautiful view and color for this season. Not being too bright and colorful, but blending in perfectly to this naturalistic landscape. Making our way just under the shady walk of this now about south uh, western path, we'll make our way up along the Harlem Mere, wrapping along to see a hidden visitor that was hanging out at our last stop. We didn't even see because of uh, its very stealthy and quiet demeanor. But zooming in a little bit, we can see a fan favorite of everybody's, one of the great egrets that regularly stops by the Harlem Mere, the pond, the lake, and just about all seven or eight of the park's water bodies. As you make your way around here, of course, you do have a little bit of competition for fishing as this is an expert fish catcher here. And as you do go fishing in the park, you can remember that fishing is allowed in all water bodies except for the reservoir. There is, I consider seven water bodies in Central Park. I don't consider uh, Azalea Pond or the Lock as a water body, but between ones like the Harlow Mere, the Pool, Turtle Pond, Conservatory Water, the Pool, and the Lake, you'll have an ample amount of fishing spots. Again, no fishing in the JKO Reservoir, but you have plenty of great options, such as here, the Harlow Mere, where the largest fish in the park can be found. Wrapping around this way, we can find not only some great spots to sit down and enjoy the park, but also great areas to enjoy some new wildlife. Um, of course, this park has gone through many changes and many different generations of use. And of course, there's constantly new generations getting to experience the park, like this newly born little turtle that we see floating around. I love how symmetrical their uh, little shells are when they're at this age, but this one being very small, I would say maybe a little bit bigger than like a half dollar size, if that, but a very beautiful little uh, surprise to see in the park. 
I'd like to try to show a little video that I took of this little turtle munching on some of the, um, what again, might look like algae, but what is actually just a clump of aquatic plants growing together that do provide food for a lot of wildlife, like this little red-eared slider, which we're about to see. Maybe that can uh, put into perspective just how small that little turtle is. Again, very, very tiny. So keep your eyes open and take a moment to stop and appreciate the mirror as you walk around. Even looking in one little patch of water, if we focus our attention in, we'll notice a bunch of little discoveries. For example, you might have noticed all the little kind of streaks or dashes in this picture. This is what looks like a very big group of little fish here. These might be minnows. Um, I'm actually not sure how to identify fish at this young of a stage, but they look to me like little tiny minnows, another one of the many varieties of fish you'll find in the Harlem Mirror. And appropriate because I mentioned earlier, 1994, that was when, um, that was when fishing actually um, just began. And during that time, or fishing at least, sorry, rather, that's when fishing um, began here in Central Park with our free rented poles. Fishing began very early on throughout the 20th century in Central Park, but the fishing poles rented for free at the Charles A. Dana Center started in 1994. And during that same year, 50,000 minnows were released and stocked into the water body. While stocking would occur over the years, primarily today we have a native population that survives. However, you can find different accounts throughout the years, such as in 1969, when a little fishing contest was held here, in which they stocked about 2,000 fish into the Harlem Mirror. Uh, during that contest, it's pretty interesting, 2,000 fish were stocked into the mirror, um, and 50 of these fish were tagged. Then we would see about the first 4,000 boys and girls under the age of 16 being given free fishing equipment to use for the day. And anybody that caught one of the 50 tagged fish would receive a free rod and reel to take home. A fun little um, active event that was done back in 1969 here in Central Park at the Heart of the Mirror. So we don't really see um, as many of these regularly uh, regular stockings occurring anymore. But you can still often see plenty of different fishing days in which they bring people to the park, bring plenty of reels and rods, and allow people to fish without a fishing license. So keep your eye out on, again, New York City Parks Department websites for those kinds of events. As we make our way up the path, we can run into some more, excuse me, run into some more wildlife. Tis the season to see turtles out of the water. And I don't just mean sunning along the sides of water bodies. During May, June, and even throughout August, uh, really, Depending the species, snapping turtles, maybe between April to September, many other turtles during May and June, they might leave the water and start hitting to unusual places. Um, maybe you'll see a turtle in the middle of the woods. Maybe you'll see one out on a lawn. What's it doing out there? It's probably looking for somewhere to lay eggs. This is the time you're gonna see many female turtles exiting the water, looking for a softer, typically maybe like a clay soil or something that'll be easier for them to dig and lay eggs in. Traditionally, turtles move quite a distance away from the water to avoid predators, as well as again, get to a softer, more fertile and less compacted area to lay their eggs in. So if you do run across a turtle out of the water during this time, don't worry, it knows what it's doing, it knows where it's going. Uh, we can leave that turtle and let it be. If the turtle is crossing a road or a very dangerous, heavily trafficked area, and you do have the time, consider potentially moving that turtle in the direction it's heading. You do wanna traditionally avoid touching wildlife, especially turtles, since they're very dirty. They do tend to have a lot of bacteria that can lead to things like salmonella. But again, especially if it's on a road and in danger of being hit by a car or a bicycle path or something like that, consider moving the turtle just a little bit in the direction that it was walking. Um, again, these turtles know what they're doing, know where they're going or, or figuring it out at least along the way. So we can let these turtles keep stomping on, continuing down the path, and adding a little bit of enjoyment for people that they pass by. And of course, carrying on the future generation of turtles, like that little one we saw swimming around the water just before. 
So we'll let this mama do her thing and keep on trucking down the path as we continue walking along this south, southern edge of the Harlem Mirror, getting some beautiful views of the Charles A. Dana Center as we make our way around. And of course, not having that fence like we saw in the earlier throwback picture, it's really amazing for experience. As we come along the path, we of course not only get to see a lot of wildlife, but hear a lot of wildlife as the red winged blackbirds are screaming like no other, letting out their traditional loud call, which I won't uh, try to mimic or do for you here, but one that you can certainly find available online or here in person if you come to any of the park's water bodies. As we continue walking down, of course, some other wildlife are a little bit later ahead in their child rearing phases, as the Canada geese are basically having almost um, fully grown adults at this point. It's probably pretty hard to tell from this photo which are the kids and which are the adults, or maybe it's pretty easy. The uh, adults are keeping watch, the kids are chowing down. But as we come towards this time of the season, it's important to remember that there's a lot of kids learning their way in the park. So if you come up on a bird that might seem all twisted around and pretzeled up, might seem like it's injured, Probably not, it's probably just a kid, you know, being a little silly, kind of learning about their body stretching out. So don't be concerned. Again, many different fledglings, younger birds are learning their way around this time. If you see a bird that's completely bald and its eyes aren't open, that bird probably needs help. But a bird that looks a little grumpy and has its feathers, that's a bird learning its way. Its parents are nearby keeping an eye out. Certainly not gonna help the bird if you're nearby. So again, let wildlife be wild and let them uh, learn their way. And there'll be future wildlife uh, giving us enjoyment next year, hopefully. As we come to the end of our walk, I do wanna just end with a little bit of construction because we talked about on our walk today, all the work and contribution that went into fixing this area up and making it immaculate. Again, the help of many different philanthropists and people that care about the park. And we see a major project occurring here that's going to add not only a lot more beauty, but a lot more use to this area of the park. What we see here was the previous site of Lasker Pool and Rink, the swimming pool that was created back in the 1960s, providing swimming during the summer months and ice skating during the winter months. Over the years, this building, of course, became very dilapidated as it really um, became run down, still receiving a lot of use, but not really receiving the proper care it needed. Running into a bunch of other issues along the way, it would finally come time to restore and really completely reconstruct this area. Looking here, we can see the previous design, which unfortunately was placed in a very obstructive and obtrusive way, one that not only limits maybe areas we can fish from, but also our enjoyment as we're fishing or walking around the Harlem Mirror. It also cut off an historic design that once existed, allowing this Harlem Mirror water body to connect to the waterway that runs through the nearby Northwoods. Luckily, this building is undergoing a major restoration currently, which should be completed in 2024, open for the swimming season of 2024, where we can expect to see this taking its place. A much more thoughtful, redesigned look of the rink, one that's going to still allow for the same general size of the swimming pool, lap pool, and skating, as well as providing a much more fluid design into the landscape, bringing back that original waterway that connects the Harlem Mirror to the lock and ravine of the Northwoods, as well as providing more accessible paths to allow us to spectate and enjoy the center, an overlook with a green roof to take away that, again, a very obtrusive view, a new little potential skating pad here along the edge of the water, as well as recreation and community center for more use of this facility. So this is something we're very excited to see coming to the Harlem Mirror area, something that's gonna, again, bring back an original design for the park and bring back more use for the landscape today. If you do check the chat box, you can find a link that we'll share that will give you plenty of information on this. On that link, you'll find again, actually another link in there to get more detailed information about this reconstruction process. But there's a lot to read up on this and a lot of really amazing features to look forward to when this rink is slated to open in 2024 for that summer swimming season. So something to look forward to, again, immense beauty continuing to arrive to Central Park. And a reminder that there is never a finish line for the work here in the park. There's always something more to do. As we come to the end of our walk, I do want to thank you for taking this nice little fishing walk around the mirror with us. 
and also remind you of all the upcoming programs we have beyond plenty of different in-person programs and live programs. We also have plenty of new events that we're launching, such as our Pride in Central Park tour launching at the end of June, as well as just a little bit before that, our Celebrate Juneteenth in Seneca Village. That's going to be occurring Sunday on June 19th between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, we really would love to see you there. It's going to be an amazing experience where we're going to have performances by world-renowned artists as they interpret, interp interpret the fascinating history and significance of Juneteenth and Seneca Village through dance, poetry, music, storytelling, art activities, and a lot more. So you can also read up on that on our website, but we'd love to see you there in person on Sunday, June 19th at 10 a.m. I'm going to be leaving this open for a few more minutes for any last minute questions that we didn't have time to get to, but um, while everybody, again, enjoys that and ask your last minute questions. I do want to thank you for joining us, for supporting us here at the Central Park Conservancy, and as always making these walks a lot of fun. We hope to see you at this event, as well as our future virtual and in-person programs. So from all of us here at the Central Park Conservancy, thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe, be well, and we'll see you soon.